Hello and be welcome to a new session of the seminar Improving Skills, Expanding Knowledge, Supporting Tools for the Master Courses on Literature and Film at the University of La Rioja. The person in charge of today's online lecture is Dr. Barbara Aritzi Martin. We are very pleased to have her here at the University of La Rioja sharing her latest research with all of us. Dr. Aritti is Senior Lecturer in English Literature at the University of Zaragoza in the Department of English and German Philology and a member of the competitive research team Contemporary Narrative in English, funded by the Government of Aragon and led by Professor Susana Onega. The research team has been awarded several national research projects financed by the Spanish Ministry of Economy and Competitiveness and the European Regional Development Fund. They are currently working on the study of transmodernity in contemporary literature in English. Dr. Aritti is a specialist in contemporary Australian literature, the relationship between ethics and the novel, trauma studies, memory studies and transmodernity. She is the author of Textuality as Striptease, a book published by Peter Lang in 2002 on the discourses of intimacy in two novels by David Lodge. She is the co-editor of the 2007 collective volume entitled On the Turn, The Ethics of Fiction in Contemporary Writing in English and has published widely in specialized journals and prestigious publishers on Lodge, Ian McEwan, Daniel Berrigan, Jean Rees, Jamaica Kincaid, Janet Turner Hospital and Tim Winton. Dr. Aditi co-edited the journal Miscellania, a journal of English and American studies between the years 2006 and 2013, and her most recent publication is the 2021 special issue Beneath the Waves, Feminisms in the Transmodern Era for the prestigious journal The European Legacy Toward New Paradigms, edited with two of her colleagues at the University of Zaragoza. Alongside her brilliant academic career, Dr. Aritti is a member of the cultural association Celtic Airs, a group promoting Irish music, literature and culture through events like the Europeans Research Night, the celebration of Bloomsday in Zaragoza or the Semana Cultural Irlandesa de Zaragoza. The group's concerts and poetry recitals have become wonderful ways of sharing their love and expertise on Ireland and Irish traditions with the general public. Dr. Aritti has always been a seriously committed person and is also an active member of La Comunidad por el Clima, a pioneering initiative that brings together people, companies, organizations and public administrations with a common goal, taking well-defined actions against climate change. Dr. Aditi's lecture today will surely offer new insights on the notions of characterization and identity two of the centerpieces of the course Estrategias de Identidad en la Literatura y el Cine en Lengua Inglesa del Máster en Estudios Avanzados en Humanidades. The title of her master's thesis, sorry, of her master's class is Female Characters, Post-Human and Transmodern Identity, a Case Study. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation, Dr. Aritti. The floor, or rather the screen, is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Asensio, for your very kind introduction and also for this opportunity to teach in, in your master's. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation which I'm going to share with you, with mainly some, some quotations from, from the novel I will analyze and, and some uh, quotations from uh, critics as well. Well, in this session, um, I'm going to analyze um, Sorry, the characters of Yolanda Kovacs and Vela Liamond, the two female protagonists of The Natural Way of Things, which is an Australian novel published by Charlotte Woods in 2015. The Natural Way of Things is a dystopian novel set in the Australian outback, and it tells the story of 10 girls in their late teens and early 20s who are kept prisoners by a mysterious corporate organization because they have been sexually involved with a series of powerful men. In my analysis of how confinement affects the identity of the heroines, I will be using two main theoretical frameworks, Rossi Raidotti's post-human theories and a more human-centered approach. 
based on the theory of transmodernity. I will first introduce the novel and then dedicate some time to explaining these two frameworks. The rest of the session will be fully focused on the characters of Yolanda and Vela with some brief concluding remarks. So the natural way of things is a feminist dystopia with some elements in common with Margaret Atwood's very famous The Hand Handmaid's Tale. If you've read Atwood's novel or probably watched Bruce Miller's television series, you will be familiar with the old fashioned vice bonnets the protagonists of Wood's novel are forced to wear. There are, however, important differences. Unlike Atwood's Gilead, this totalitarian state in the near future, in Wood's novel, the action unfolds in contemporary times and concerns small community kept away from society. It is not clear whether the purpose of the detention center, which is run by three warders, two males and a female, is to rehabilitate the young women or simply to wreak revenge on them. The girls have their heads shaved on arrival like the inmates of Nazi concentration camps and must dress in strange prairie workhouse tunics, very unsuitable for the very hot weather and the heavy manual work they are made to perform. The place looks like a sheep station or maybe a wheat farm the remnant of Australia's colonial past and is encircled by a tall, impassable electric fence. Let's first consider the novel's title, The Natural Way of Things. I would like to point out two main meanings, two main readings, which are important for understanding the female characters. One is concerned with the idea of the normal and the second with being part of the natural way, the world, sorry. The natural way of things might imply something that has become normal, ordinary or usual after a time, despite being intrinsically aberrant. In The Handmaid's Tale, Aunt Julia says that ordinary is what you're used to. This may not seem ordinary to you now, but after a time it will, it will become ordinary. The external narrator of Wood's novel supports this first reading, as we can see in the following quotation. What would people in their own lives be saying about these girls? Would they be called missing? Would it be said they disappeared, were lost? Would it be said they were abandoned or taken? The way people said a girl was attacked, the woman was raped, this femaleness always at the centre, as if womanhood itself were the cause of these things. As if the girls somehow, through the natural way of things, did it to themselves. They lured abduction and abandonment to themselves. They marshaled themselves into this prison where they had made their beds and now once more were lying on them. This quotation is obviously about gender issues. The insidious normalized violence against females, which is often blamed on them and which ignores male responsibility, as is clear in the use of the passive voice. This ingrained sexism of society is no doubt the central topic of Wood's novel. I have gathered some fragments from reviews of the natural way of things from Wood's official web page. They describe the novel as an exploration of contemporary misogyny that takes apart the mentality of patriarchy, the handmaid's tale for our age of sensational media and reality television. A preview of what could happen to women who rock the boat, resisting predation or asserting their own sexual freedom. Susan Windham alludes retrospectively to the significance of the natural way of things. The novel was both sharply contemporary and timeless in its portrayal of women under duress. Wood perfectly captured the zeitgeist, anticipating not only the TV adaptation of Margaret Atwood's 1985 novel, The Handmaid's Tale, but the entire Me Too movement. I find it significant that Wood has drawn the scandals for which the young women uh, are incarcerated from real events in the Australian popular media. These are incidents in which women have been belittled, demonized or portrayed as deserving of the violence committed against them, 
such as sexual harassment in the workplace, date rape on a cruise ship, gang rape by a football team, being the victims of revenge porn, among others. So let's now turn to the second meaning of the title, related to the natural world, which will be the backbone to my approach uh, of the novel. As Brewster and Cossio remark, the natural way of things is also a story of female empowerment and counter agency in the face of patriarchal violence. This is especially the case with Yolanda Kovacs and Vela Liamond, the two protagonist women, who decide to cast off their roles as victims and stand up to their guards. At a certain point in the story, the electric power is cut off, except for the, for the fence, and the prisoners learn that they are left to starve together, girls and guards. So it is then that the girls decide to act. According to John Powers, Yolanda and Vela strip away the historical veneer of our female subservience. They recreate themselves based on a deeper, more complicated vision of the natural order, one that grasps the bond between all living beings. As I said before, in my analysis of Yolanda and Vela, I will be using right bodies, post-human theories, and the theories of transmodernity. So let's start with Raidoti. I'm particularly interested in two ideas by, by her. The first is the distinction uh, she makes between Zoe and bias, and the second, her emphasis on the continuity between nature and culture. Raidoti defines Zoe as the non-human vital force of life, and bias as life as the prerogative of Anthropos. In fact, we can trace back these two terms to classical Greece, as Giorgio Agamben explains in the following quotation. The Greeks had no single term to express what we mean by the word life. They used two terms that are semantically and morphologically distinct. Zoe, which expressed the simple fact of living common to all living beings, animals, men or gods, and bias which indicated the form or way of living proper to an individual or a group. Braidotti defends the primacy of Zoe over bias and challenges anthropocentrism. As a matter of fact, bias, life as the prerogative of humans, cannot be separated from Zoe, the life of animals and non-human entities. Instead, Braidotti speaks of a nature-culture continuum and this affects the way she understands identity. For her, the self is embodied, embedded in nature, and fundamentally relational. Braidotti believes that this post-human, post-anthropocentric idea of identity is particularly appealing to women because they have been traditionally excluded from the category of the human. I will complement my reading of the natural way of things following Braidotti with an analysis of the character of Vela in the context of transmodernity, a more human-centered perspective. But what is transmodernity? This is a term more and more critics are now using to label the present moment in history and to refer to a set of beliefs, attitudes and behaviors. Transmodernity is then both a period term and a distinct way of being in the world. The Spanish philosopher Rosa Maria Rodríguez Magda explains that transmodernity is a dialectical synthesis between modernity and postmodernity that is characterized, among many other things, by supportive, caring individualism. Mark Lewis emphasizes the relational, interdependent nature of transmodernity. It is interesting that he believes that women across the world are indispensable in pushing for this new transmodern mindset. This is still a minority paradigm, Lewis says, defined by respect for mother nature, care for communities, for family relations, for internal growth, for other cultures, desire for another economic logic, etc. Irina Atelievich, Atelievich sorry, describes transmodernity as a planetary vision in which humans are beginning to realize that we are all, including plants and animals, connected into one system, 
which makes us all interdependent, vulnerable and responsible for the Earth as an indivisible living community. There are some connections between transmodernity and right all these uh, post-human theories, especially uh, related to Bright Odie's emphasis on Zoe. Uh, this we can clearly see in the following quotation. Transmodern novels postulate a continuum between all living things, from the mineral and vegetal to the human through the animal world. Such a vision implies considering all life forms as just that, living entities, hence vulnerable creatures. Needless to say, the presentation of such a vulnerability provides an ethical response, since vulnerability excludes autonomy and calls for a vision of subjects and beings as interconnected and more specifically interdependent. This quotation also advances some big issues in the natural way of things, especially the interconnection between all forms of life based on our common vulnerability. My focus, as I said before, will be largely on the characters of Yolanda and Vela and their different reactions to confinement and degradation. The two of them undertake, as we shall see, a revision of the ideas of the natural and the human. And this revision rests on the continuity, as Praidoti says, between bios and zoe, culture and nature. The new identities Yolanda and Vela have acquired at the end of the novel challenge the primacy of culture over nature and the exclusion of other than human animals. However, we will also see how the paths of the two protagonists increasingly diverge. Yolanda will move to the part of the spectrum closer to Zoe, while Vela draws strength from meaningful, sorry, from meaningful purely human practices anchored in the relational. I will divide the rest of this uh, session into two main, main sections, becoming animal and at home with Zoe. The first uh, section explores Yolanda's turn to animality, mostly drawing on Bright Odie's theory of the post human, but also resorting to Jeremy Rifkin's ideas on empathy and animal rights, which, is, which are closer to the transmodern mindset. The second section concerns Vela, but I will briefly return to Yolanda when I analyze the ending of the novel. Although I will not lose sight of Zoe, the vital force of life, this second section fully revolves around relationality as conceived by transmodern thinkers and other scholars in the orbit of transmodernity. The turn to the relational is prompted by Verla's memories of her disabled father back home. I argue that despite the fact that the natural way of things highlights the nature culture continuum and acknowledges the significance of Zoe, the novel through the character of Vela finally supports the turn to the relational in the concrete forms of empathy and care. So let's start with the first section, becoming animal. The natural world, animals in particular, plays a key role in the natural way of things. There are frequent allusions to native and non-native fauna, from the kookaburras mentioned in the opening sentence of the novel, to the wild rabbits the girls feed on, through to kangaroos, guanas, the lice that infest the girl's hair when it grows back, and a little brown trout Vela dreams of when she falls seriously ill and which reappears in the closing sentences of the novel. Besides, in the natural way of things, the women are treated like animals. They are leashed to one another and they sleep in small kennel-like cells. Vela notices that the girls breathe through their mouths like animals. Vela is not an animal, she thinks. She is a parliamentary intern, a rightful citizen, and the lover of a cabinet minister. Vela feels superior to the other girls in terms of class and education, and is sure she will be released soon. When his staff treachery is discovered and Andrew gets her out, when she's released, not rescued, that word for stupid princesses and children, she will advocate for these girls. When the guards start to lose control, the word animal acquires a different, more empowering meaning. Yolanda picks a bunch of old rusty rabbit traps 
and sets out to provide food. Verla can sense what Teddy, one of the two men in charge, feels about the two girls. He frowns down and Verla knows he's thinking, ugh, at the two filthy girls, that he is freshly fearful of the lice eggs in their matted hair, of Verla stretched white with illness, of Yolanda and her rusted weaponry. He fears their thin feral bodies, their animal disease and power. From the beginning, Yolanda is associated with animals. In contrast to the other girls, Yolanda tells Bella with pride that she was not tricked into coming to the institution. She fought. Like always, her dumb dog's body knew, and then the large hands came gripping, and it was her body kicking like fuck and spitting and screaming. Bella compares herself with her friend, and, and she thinks, at the same moment as Yolanda roared and kicked and bit, Vela complied. She is stronger than me. When the electric power is cut off and they cannot even boil the dry noodles that are their only food, Yolanda goes rabbit hunting. She sets her traps every day and demonstrates her abilities at the traditional masculine role of hunter and provider. She knows they all depend on her. This is what makes Yolanda strong, the knowledge that without her, without her traps, they would have all perished by now. Only Yolanda is keeping them alive. In her previous life, Yolanda had been the victim of a gang rape. She did not dare report. She did not move. She did not cry. She would be blamed. Now, in her new role, she manages to keep Bonser, the second male guard, at bay. You will never, ever touch me. As months go by, the character's civilized identity dwindles. How altered they are. Now, when Vela tries to remember herself, that long ago girl struggling to the surface of her sedation, she cannot. It is as if she's trying to inhabit some other creature, some impossible existence, like that of a cuttlefish, a worm, a tree. As we shall see in the natural way of things, we witness the decay of bias in favor of Zoe. And of all the young women, Yolanda is the most changed. Yolanda felt some primitive strength mounting as she scrubbed and stretched, as she marched the paddocks and set and sprang the traps. It was a vigor to do with air and the earth, animal blood and guards, the moon and the season. It was beyond her name self, beyond girl or female, beyond human even. It was to do with muscle sliding around bone, to do with animal speed and scent and bloody heartbeat and breath. Yolanda has become the embodiment of life as Zoe, as positive vitality in Bright Audi's words. The other girls invest her with a kind of natural authority, they look to Yolanda for what to do now. And Vela notices she is healthier than the rest. She has blood in her cheeks. It is fit from the walking and carrying. One of Bridaudi's most interesting points for the analysis of the natural way of things is her belief that the relational capacity of the post-human subject is not confined within our species, but it includes all non-anthropomorphic elements. Traditionally, animals have suffered the most from the anthropocentric views of classical humanism. The Spanish philosopher and uh, poet Jorge Rickman describes modern livestock factories as extermination camps and torture chambers for animals. Anne Bredotti herself also records some of the terrible practices animals presently endure. They are manipulated, mistreated, tortured, sold as exotic commodities, bred in industrial farming, locked up in battery cage production units. Pride Audi defends a form of Zoe-centered egalitarianism as a way of curbing not only sexism, but also speciesism, the discrimination against non-human animals. Sexism and speciesism, states Margarita Carretero González, refuse to see human females and other than human animals of whatever gender as sentient individuals 
with complex inner worlds, reducing them instead to objectified bodies. Sorry. It is, uh, sorry, get that. Ready now. It is sufficiently clear that Woods, in the natural way of things, speaks against sexism. However, the way he portrays the relationships with non-human animals is much more uh, complex. Three main ideas in this respect. First, the natural way of things acknowledges the continuity and the interpenetration between life as biased and life as Zoe. The second idea, the novel features a mild form of speciesism since the prisoners feed on rabbits. And the third idea is that the novel also features an extreme kind of Zoe-centered egalitarianism in the character of Yolanda. Yolanda's attitude towards animals evolves throughout the novel, first into greater empathy and second, and more shockingly, into total identification with the animal world, especially rabbits. The following quotation describing how she releases a dead rabbit from her trap clearly illustrates her empathic mood. She held its head briefly in her palm, feeling the weight of it and looking into its black eye. Sorry, she said to him silently. Thank you. She had found she had begun to feel differently about the rabbits over the past weeks. So, as you can see, animals are now considered sentient beings. Raidotti is in two minds about the growth in empathy towards animals in contemporary times, which is apparent in the burgeoning animal rights movement. On the one hand, she regards empathy across the species as extremely relevant for a post-human theory of the subject. But on the other hand, for Raidotti, this might be a form of compensatory humanism. She affirms that extending to animals the principle of moral and legal equality may be a noble gesture, but it is inherently flawed because it confirms the hegemony of the human over the animal and denies the specificity of animals altogether. I understand and partly share Bridot's views on animals as radical others. Also, her insistence on not losing sight of the pitfalls of classical humanism. But by and large, I am closer to the ideas of Jeremy Rifkin on the subject. In the work The Empathic Civilization, The Race to Global Consciousness in a World in Crisis, Rifkin measures the progress made by humanity in terms of empathy, and he sees the current concern with animals as proof of a new empathic awareness. According to him, although animal rights activists acknowledge that the rights of other creatures differ in degree and kind from human rights, they believe that their individual journey is no less significant and meaningful than our own. The natural way of things highlights the growth uh, in empathy towards animals, a proof of this extension of empathy beyond the human sphere that uh, Rifkin mentions. At the same time, the fact that the characters feed on the meat of the rabbits, Yolanda Hans seems to endorse a ranking of human and non-human animal rights. More disturbingly, Yolanda's animalization shows the perils of fully committing oneself to Zoe to the detriment of bias. On the other hand, Sorry, on the one hand, becoming animal is her way out of imprisonment. At night, she dreamed herself with claws, digging a barrow, tunneling out under the fence into the teeming bush, not returning to her old life, never back there, but inwards, downwards, running on all fours, smelling the grass and the earth as familiar as her own body. She dreamed of an animal freedom. On the other hand, this situates her on the edge of the community. The smell of her body and of the rabbit skins that cover it repels the other women. Her own smell beginning to match with the animals made the other girls hold their noses and make noises as they shoved past her. By the end of the novel, Yolanda is almost all animal. She rarely speaks and she is taken to living on the paddocks. 
Yolanda no longer comes into the house at all. She eats with her hands, sitting on the veranda, leaving bowls licked and bones scattered for the rats. Her radical form of Zoe, ega, Zoe egalitarianism between human and animals turns out to be problematic for her and for the community of girls. At some point in the narrative, Yolanda is out on the fields, setting her traps, and she catches sight of a hot air balloon close enough to be seen and heard by the people in it. She would cry out, we are prisoners, get help. But she can only roar up at them, waving her rabbit mittened hands in the air. Her trapped animals cry fails to establish meaningful communication with the humans and the balloon finally spins away. Yolanda not only renounces his language, but has also abandoned empathy and moral action. By the end of the novel, she fails to stop one of the girls who is pregnant by a guard on her way to the electric fence to kill herself. She watched Hetty's slow crawl up the hill, not raising the alarm, not giving chase, not trying to save Hetty. The Yolanda, who might once have done those things, who ran after the balloon, that Yolanda might also at least have whispered goodbye Hetty, but she did not whisper anything. Her friend Vela witnesses her process of animalization and believes her mad. She suddenly wants to cry out for Yolanda gone mad with rabbit filth and guts. She cried. She cries for the ordinary girl Yolanda once was, who will never return. Their friendship, Vela realizes, is no longer a form of human friendship, but more like the bodily speechless way of a man and his dog. Let's now turn to the second section, which fo focuses on, on Vela. The character of Vela also evokes, sorry, evolves during captivity. I will analyze her in contrast with uh, Yolanda as she remains within the human, but her evolution also highlights the continuity between Bios and Zoe. She is a creature of the animals, of kangaroo and horse. She's a little brown trout, very still in the water. More and more, Vela has memories of her disabled father and misses caring for him as she used to. Her father, what will he be doing now? He will miss her speechlessly and nobody will know. There were days she would wheel him down to the jetty and pack him there while she smoked and then unwrap the fish and chip paper and feed each sliver into his grinning, vulnerable mouth. She sends him out a prayer, I am still your daughter. In fact, the whole novel is dotted by instances of empathy and care. They are sparse at the beginning, but become more visible and significant as the story progresses. Early in the novel, all the girls cry out when one of them is brutally beaten by a guard. And two girls gently take her elbows and raise her to stand. They comfort each other while they cry for their mothers and fathers for home. Often the narrative highlights meaningful, purely human practices. When Nancy, the third mentally unstable water, dies of a morphine overdose, the girls carefully wash her body, wipe her face and comb back her hair in preparation for the funeral pyre. They have hated Nancy, wished her dead. But now they see she's only one of them. And for the first time, they wonder if she has a mother too. Her funeral turns into a powerful communal ceremony. The girls had huddled together, closer together, arms about each other's shoulders, tending the fire, keeping watch, holding vigil. Only joy sings, uh, joy sings clear and low. The natural cycle of life and death feels complete when, in the light of the bonfire, the girls notice Hetty's pregnancy. One body disintegrates in flame and another forms in water, cell by cell, by duplicating cell. It is significant that the two, female, sorry, the two male warders do not take part in the ritual. Here, the narrator explains, laying the dead to rest, like washing and feeding and birth, 
is women's work. We can read, sorry, we can read these practices through Maria del Carmen Garcia Aguilar's Transmodern Ethics, an ethics that fully accounts for the experience of women. Garcia Aguilar advocates for an inclusive vision in consonance with the new times and promotes values traditionally associated with women, such as care and solidarity. This new form of ethics, she believes, can help improve relationships between humans as well as with the ecosystem as a whole, two major concerns in the natural way of things. The illness and death of Ponser, one of the guards, provides another opportunity to show the characters engaged in caring practices. Izzy takes pity first, cleaning his arse, washing him in the tepid tank water, emptying his vomit bolts away. Vela takes over, nursing and comforting him. She thinks of all the times she held her father's saddle hand, and for a fleeting moment she holds bonsers to her lips. His mother looks so normal, says Leandra, when they find a family picture in his wallet. It is precisely his mother, Bonser whimpers uh, for in his final agony, adding to the novel's Back to Basics call. In my opinion, looking after Nancy and Bonser draws attention to the continuity between Zoe and Bias, nature and culture. These two examples evoke vulnerability as a shared condition of existence, and at the same time, they present human beings, women in this case, as symbolic animals in need of meaningful social rites and ceremonies. In other words, they show the characters at home with Zoe while not losing their grip on the specifically human. So let's finally focus on the novel's ending. The natural way of things has an open ending, which some reviewers regard as ambivalent. This is what one reviewer writes. I'd like to tell you that this is a happy ending, but Wood is too honest to offer anything so reassuringly easy. Even as her heroines begin a radical new way of living, Wood knows that the natural way of things is as risky and wild as it is free. I agree there is a certain degree of uh, ambivalence in Wood's ending, but in my opinion, the last few pages definitely prove the novel's commitment to a relational view of life akin to transmodernity. It is true that the, the ending of the novel reveals an ugly world where male chauvinism still holds the lead. But it is also true that the novel opens up new dimensions in understanding the natural way of things, especially in its revision of notions of escape and survival through Yolanda but more clearly through Verla's radical choices. Once the three guards are dead, the third is killed by a girl he has raped, the electric power comes suddenly back. The girls believe they will soon be released and they spend the last nights in celebration. It was an awe filled with longing and wonder as their old lives came seeping, then trickling, then hurtling back the jobs, the streets, the houses where they lived, the boyfriends. Only Yolanda did not smile, but nibbled on pink rabbit flesh and grunted as if she always had been this way. The girls giggled, picturing her back in the world. Imagine that filth in an apartment, an office. Imagine Yolanda shopping. It seems clear at this stage that the scales tip back towards bias. The young women prepare themselves to rejoin civilization, and Yolanda's animalization excludes her from fitting in. Two quotations from, sorry, yes, two quotations from Rickman again are pertinent here. As a human being, I am conscious life that wants to live. I am life that, in the course of evolution, has reached awareness, understands its situation and knows that it is up to its own behavior, that of the animal called Homo sapiens, whether suffering increases or diminishes in its biospheric home, or even whether it remains a welcoming home for thousands of millions of living creatures, rather than a progressively hostile and impoverished planet. 
In this first quotation, Rickman draws attention to the special responsibility of human beings towards other than human creatures. Somewhere else, he advocates for an ethics of care that transcends relationships among human beings, and he speaks of a politics of friendship. However, as he warns in the second quotation, there is no way back to the pre-human animal. We have no other good way out. We know that we have been expelled from the Garden of Eden. We cannot be hunter-gatherers again, and even less so pre-human animals. And we also know that there is no possible return. Rickman's words cast a rather disturbing light on the fact that Yolanda ends up by fully embracing animality as a way out of captivity. Soon, Perry, a representative of this organization which holds the girls captive, turns up driving an unnaturally yellow bus and he hands the girls some presents. All girls except Yolanda and Vela fall happily back into their most superficial form of bias, their worshipping of luxury beauty brands. The man smiling benignly down while they cry out and unscrew bottles and squish creams into their hands and press sticky gloss to their flaking lips with their dirty fingers. Meanwhile, Yolanda escapes through the fence, spinning low and fast as a rabbit off into the scrub. In her own animal way, she has invited Vela to join her. She nods at Vela and jerks her head towards the fields, holding out her dirty mittened hand. But Vela wants to go home. At home, her father waits in his chair, his ghost hand waving. On the bus, however, Vela repents her decision. She notices the driver takes an unexpected turn and realizes they might all be taken to an even worse place. Vela considers eating a poisonous mushroom she has kept while she muses on her identity. The question of who she is has kept her wondering since she arrived at the prison. Now at the end of the novel, Vela has reached a degree of self-knowledge. She is a being in relation. She needs to know what she is. She is a daughter and she whispers sorry to her father, and she sees herself doing it. She closes her eyes and forgives her mother, says goodbye to her father. Then she evo evokes her friend Yolanda, her protector, fellow creature. I love you. I am your sister and you are mine. Eventually, Vela is able to utter the words, I refuse. They thrust up through Vela's center, bursting into flower, in her mouth. In a last communal act, the other girls force Perry to stop the bus and let Vela out in the outback. She knows she might die and that Yolanda is already far away. But thinking of Yolanda, so vigorously alive in her rabbit self, sends memories of the little brown trout of her fever dreams. Vela turns away from the setting sun and begins trudging down the gravel road. The novel ends with two very simple sentences that evoke a haiku, the short Japanese poetic form. The little trout twitches and is gone. Only the clear water moves in its wake. The haiku works by juxtaposing two concrete images from the natural world and focuses on the transpersonal rather than on the personal. Bruce Ross describes the essence of haiku as the particular feeling and emotion, selflessness, nature and beauty and wholeness. And he stresses its deepness, its existential quality and its capacity to transform. Bruce uh, Ross sorry, summarizes the haiku as an absolute metaphor of the natural particular and the universal. In the end, what is underscored is the deeper, more complicated vision of the natural order, a flash of the bond between all living beings pointed out by powers. The continuity between nature and culture, Zoe and Pius, acquires a new depth through the character of Perla and her little brown trout. 
life is presented not only as open-ended, but as a radically trans but as radically transcending any kind of dual relation, sorry, dual rational thinking through an awareness of emptiness. This awareness of emptiness is very characteristic of haikus and hints at the underlying ultimate connection between all that there is. Summarizing in this class, I have approached the two female protagonists of the natural way of things through the synergies and also the differences between bright bodies, post-human theories and a wider transmodern framework. We have seen how through the transformation of their identities, the novel highlights the continuity between Zoe and bias, nature and culture. The two heroines gradually accept those aspects of their selves that are closer to the animal world. Yolanda's becoming animal grants her a basic form of survival, a quiet animal triumph. However, her letting go of the human aspects of the continuum by Zoe is depicted as an involution. In fact, I believe her animalization contributes to the dystopian undertones of the narrative. But dystopias, hopefully, often hide their own utopian streak. In the natural way of things, this streak is associated with meaningful relationality, characteristic of transmodernity. Family relations, empathy, solidarity and care for the community gain prominence as the story progresses, mainly associated with the character of Vela, but amplified by the group of girls. The social evils would uh, Wood's story denounces, the ingrained sexism of society in particular, need to be tackled in the terrain of the human, knowing that it is always already intimately interpenetrated by the non-human. Vela turns out to be instrumental in bridging the traditional poles of Bios and Zoe. Her quest for an identity does not exclude the animal force of life, but appears as firmly grounded in her human role especially that of a daughter and a sisterly friend, until right at the end of the novel, the human-animal distinction dissolves into a deeper, more basic bond, represented by the clear water holding the little brown trout in the haiku-like final lines of the novel. And next, I have included a couple of slides with the works uh, I have mentioned, I've quoted from in my, in my uh, talk. First, that's the second. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Aditi. And it has been a, a wonderful talk, a very enlightening talk. And it is very interesting for our students to learn about other cultures and to learn about other literatures that we are not um, used to teaching at the University of La Rioja. So I, I would like to um, listen now to uh, my colleague, Carlos Villarflor, who is going to ask uh, a few questions. Thank you very much, Mar, and thank you very much, Barbara, for you. this very insightful talk, uh, bringing in notions from post-humanism, transmodernity, rational relationality, ethics of care, feminism, animal rights, activism, characterization. Well, you have been giving us a lot of uh, food for thought. Yeah? And, and, and I'm afraid that it's, it's, it's a pity that we don't discuss the natural way of things in our master course. Uh, this year at least, but probably next year, uh, we have to discuss this among the three colleagues that teach this course probably will be a very nice and very um, interesting compulsory reading in our course, right? Okay, so uh, I have different questions, but I'm afraid that probably we won't have time for more than one or two. Um, well, I, I would like to, to ask you um, about the, uh, the feminist approach to this novel, to the natural way of things, from the point of view of uh, Yolanda's characterization, right? Uh, how do you um, contemplate the Yolanda's characterization from a feminist perspective, providing that 
she's presented as, as a very strong character that overcomes uh, her complexes, her past uh, in treatment, and, and she becomes empowered in a way. But at the same time, uh, she becomes animalized. And, and uh, in, in your conclusion, you, you pointed out that there is a sort of involution in, in, in her characterization, in her transformation, right? So uh, how do you harmonize this sort of involution with the fact that she's the one that, that shows the greatest strength of all the girls, of the 10 girls that are trapped there because they are trapped. And, and so she's the one, the first one who, who manages to overcome this situation and, and gets empowered. So I would like you to discuss this a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, th thank you very much, Dr. Villar. Yes, you are right that uh, Yolanda is a very ambivalent character because on the on the one hand, she appears as uh, the one providing from them for them all, the, the strongest of all the, the characters, and that's right. But uh, perhaps this strength is part of her turning into an animal, right? She develops it as, as the, the narrative progresses and, and she becomes more and more uh, identified yeah, with, the, with the animal world. And this has very positive connotations for a feminist reading of, of the character, yeah? being strong, being able, able to cast off her previous role as victim, but at the same time, her option is presented as too radical by, by the narrative, because I think she 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 definitely overdoes this this idea of, of uh, um, turning to the animal well for strength, hmm? because there, there is a moment in the in the narrative in which she uh, she she says that she she's not even female anymore, yeah, and this uh, in fact is questioning hmm? or. or uh, kind of feminist concerns, yeah. She renounces uh, her 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 femaleness and, and, and her, her her humanity, in fact. Yeah? So uh, I think it is the character of Vela uh, that that wins the day by by the end of the novel, hmm? because she manages to combine uh, this um, identification with it, well this uh, acknowledging uh, this this recognition that we are all animals, that this vital force of life is in all of us, this Zoe. But at the same time, she manages to keep her uh, feet firmly grounded on the idea of the human. She does not need to renounce humanity to, 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 to become uh, a fuller, more mature uh, character. This is what I, what I think. All right, thank you. And I am also very interested in the transition uh, and from the point of view of characters, right? Uh, uh, the set of characters that initially uh, play the role of oppressors are right? the two guards and and the and the nurse, so-called nurse Nancy, I think is her name. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, uh, they they are the oppressors, but uh, uh, eventually there is a turning point in the narrative in which they they become also victims of the of the uh, situation, right? Uh, but uh, this coincides with this uh, awareness on the part of of Yolanda that uh, that she has to be stronger than her captors. Uh, well, how do you understand this uh, transition or this turning point from um, oppressors to victims and from victims to oppressors on the other way around? Well, they, 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 there is this turning point, in fact. Uh, partly due to the circumstances, yeah, the, 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 the three warders were not expecting uh, this being abandoned by the organization to, to, to their fate. Yeah? So this, in, in a sense, weakens their, their uh, um, strength and, and, and their, their, uh, the fact that they dominate the, the girls. Yeah? They, they, they um, evolved, I mean, they become dependent on, on the girls, in fact, yeah? especially Yolanda, eh, because they, they have no other way of, of feeding themselves. Yeah? So in the end, they become dependent on, on, on Yolanda. But at the same time, this provokes a reaction on the part of the two warders, especially the, the male warders, which try to get hold of the situation again and become more vicious than, than, than they were before. Yeah? This is when they rape one of the girls, when they, uh, they, they, they become physically violent against them. 
but in the end they are all defeated in uh, some way or other by, by the girls. In the case of the two male warders, one of them is killed by the girl, the girl he has raped and the other one um, eats, a uh, bonser eats a, a, a poisonous mushroom that uh, Vela uh, tries to keep for, for herself, but in, in, by mistake he eats the mushroom and, and, and he's poisoned and, and he dies, right? And then we have Nancy, the, the nurse, this uh, mentally unstable guard, who dies of a morphine overdose, yeah? and she's not directly killed by the uh, the girls, yeah? but the two other male warders are. So yes, in the end, it is the the girls yeah, that that dominate the the situation, especially Yolanda with her animal uh, strength, but also Vela. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, obviously, this novel, uh, the Natural Way of Things, uh, is a very rich story, uh, allowing different layers of meaning and interpretations, and also obviously allowing uh, the application of many different uh, methods of um, literary analysis. Uh, and basically, uh, well, you have pointed out that the, the ending is uh, an open ending, and that perhaps in this novel could be uh, viewed as an allegory, but in your opinion, an allegory of what exactly? Obviously, this is your own personal opinion, but, but I would be interested to know. An allegory, uh, an allegory of um, well, first the power of females you know, in the first in the face of of this um, insidious sexism of, of society and how they can, in the end, escape at least in, in the two characters of Ella and Yolanda. So it might be an allegory of of female empowerment. You know? But for me, there is a deeper reading of the novel, which is the one encouraged by the by the ending. And uh, there are like two levels in the in this uh, reading. The first is we are all uh, intimately connected, and this is what Bright Audi says when when she says that there is no separation between Zoe and Bias. There's this part of a spectrum of a continuum, right? And besides. In this uh, closing sentence, yeah, which I interpret as a haiku, even this continuum dissolves, yeah, and 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 this becomes an allegory of a deeper bond, yeah, which is more, which is subtler and more mysterious yeah, than this suppose th this uh, actual, this real continuity between Zoe and and Bias. Yeah? So I don't know an allegory of, uh, I don't know, the, the the mystery of life itself. I don't know. OK, so. Thank you very much. Dr. Aditi. This has been a very, very enlightening session, and I agree with my colleague Dr. Villar that we should think about uh, including somehow the novel that you have uh, so interestingly presented uh, us today. We are sure we are clearly sure that listening to you has been both a pleasure and a mind opening experience for everybody that has joined us. And of course, I would like to thank everybody that has been um, taking part of this session and that is taking part of this seminar, which is meant to enhance um, their interest and understanding of both literature and film. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Aritti. Um, a pleasure as usual. Thank you. Bye. Bye.